Hi there. Um, I found that I had a real major hole in my game that was causing me great equity loss. And it's in the middle game checker play. It's after the second or third or fourth roll in that range where I'm not quite sure of my game plan. I've memorized the opening moves and the second roll moves and generally get those right at all scores just because I've memorized them and studied them so much. But it's impossible to memorize the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth rolls. There's just too many combinations. And at th that point in the game, the plays become quite difficult for most people, including me. And I'll tell you why. Uh, when you get further deep into the game on the seventh, eighth, tenth, twelfth rolls, by then the game is pretty mature and the game plan becomes usually uh, much simpler to define. You know that you're running the race or you know you need to be in a hitting game, he's well up in the race, or you know you're playing a priming game. And now it's a matter of finding the best checker play. But in these kinds of positions, after the third or fourth roll, the game plan can swing greatly depending on the roll. You might have a, a, a chance to play either a good racing or priming game or a hitting game. And at the same time, you're not always sure of your opponent's game plan. So it becomes a little bit more difficult. And you could easily make a huge error here that would swing the game completely around and cost you the match or cost you the game. So it's critically important to get good at these, and you can't do it by memorization. You have to do it with skill. You have to do it with references and with practice and learning how to analyze what's going on in each position. So what I've done is I've developed a lesson plan, and I get lots of help from my teaching partners, Dick and David Rockwell and Perry and John O'Hagan. Uh, they provide me with positions and with answers and explanations and lots of times when I'm stumped or I'm not sure I've got a good answer, I'll send them an email and they'll uh, give me a very good explanation that I can pass on to my students. So here's the exercise that I do with my students. I take a typical position like this and I ask you, how do you play a 5-1? How would you play a 5-1 here? There are several roles, several options that come to mind. You could hit off the three-point that's pretty ugly. It leaves lots of blots. You could hit off the ace point. That's also pretty ugly because if you get hit back, you're not happy. And if you don't get hit back, you've got this checker all the way down to the ace point, although it's not a ridiculous play. Uh, you could come out to his bar. That gives him a lot of shots and lots of options. And here, his game plan looks to be like he's got a pretty good priming game, and you're going to help him do that quite a bit if he hits you loose off the bar because you don't always hit him back, and now he's made the bar point. It looks pretty logical to come down with the five. And that is the right play, by the way. Where's the one? Looks like you've got two options. You can play 24-23, or you can play 23-22. Which one do you think makes more sense? Okay, the answer is not to make the two-point. If you make the two-point, you are going to make, make it difficult for you to get out. Uh, you only can get out with fives. You are safer. You are uh, much safer from attack than if you keep them spread. But attacking isn't necessarily the best game plan for him. He'd rather play a priming game, and I'm not sure he really wants to attack you on the three-point anyway. And it makes gives you a lot more flexibility to keep them spread. You can now race from here and get out with a nine. You've got two checkers shooting at this checker or any checkers he puts in the outfield. Six, uh, four can make this point. A, 3-1 could make this point. Uh, just any 2 makes this point. It gets, gives you a lot of flexibility. So one of the things I do is say, if you want to prove a point or understand the position better, change the play. Change the position slightly. How would you play a 5-1 now? It's still right to come down with the 5. Would you now make the 3 point or come up? Well, making the 3 point is much better. You're making a higher point. Uh, you're stopping him from priming you. With From here, you can get out with sixes and fours. You have a lot more flexibility holding the three-point than the two-point. Look how huge it is to make the three-point, and it was terrible to make the two-point. So this position I haven't memorized. I may not see this exact position for a long time, but I've learned a basic concept from doing this. I've learned that it's better to keep them split rather than make the two-point 
in these kinds of positions. And it's better to make the three-point than keeping them split. The, making his opponent's three-point is much more valuable than making his two-point in this particular position. And by the way, in many, many positions that are going to be similar to this. So right off the bat, with this exercise, you've learned a valuable lesson. What I do suggest is going through every single roll. Start with double one. How do you play it? One, two, one, three, one, four. By the time you're done with playing every single roll, you'll understand this position and your game plan and 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 what the nuances of this position much better. Here's another one. How would you play a five two? Well, You've made the two point. You've got an excellent hitting game. You didn't want to hit loose before, but now you can hit two. So a hitting game becomes your best game plan. You have a major uh, advantage in playing a hitting game, and it stops him from continuing his priming game. You would do the same thing with a three two. Obviously, a three two you're going to hit twice. Oh, wrong. Three two, you make the point. Okay, I was wrong. I got carried away with the hitting game. You can make a wonderful point in his inner board. Hitting twice would not necessarily be the right play with a 3-2, does is it? So don't get carried away. Don't jump to assumptions. Look at every possible play. I blew it just now. I'm not embarrassed. I blow it often, when I, especially when I do it quickly. And that's, a, that's probably the best lesson you can learn here, too. Take your time on these plays. Look at every alternative and look at the alternative plays. How would you play a 6-2? Let's get past my mistake very quickly. And by the way, I don't have to record this tape. I could re-record it and eliminate that mistake. This is how honest I am and how ready I am to admit that I'm far from perfect and far from uh, always making the right play, particularly when I'm going fast. How do you play a 6-2? I love going out to, uh, to either of these points and distracting him and duplicating numbers and making it difficult for him to make the bar point and these points by going out here. It's a great racing number, but still you have a better game plan to hit twice. And by the way, why is it better to go out to the 15 and the 16? I'm not going to get into that now, but that's a good question to ask yourself between those two plays. There's so much you can learn. There's a great saying, every disciplined action brings multiple rewards by doing this exercise, we've learned about anchoring on the one point or two point. We've learned that it's better to hit twice and play a hitting game. But if you can only hit once, generally, you wouldn't play a hitting game. Uh, we've learned that another major concept here is because your opponent is winning, uh, we are also not just concerned with our game plan. We're concerned with how do we keep him from priming? He has a very good chance with a 4-1, 6-1, double one. Uh, a double three to make the bar point, which could really hurt us. He's got a good priming game going. Four, two, double four, make this point. Five, three, makes this point. All of those are good priming plays, and the double hit stops that. Uh, so again, go through every possible roll. Then, when you're done with that, start hitting these little buttons down here. Change it to DMP, gammon save, and gammon go, and see how that changes your strategies in some of the plays, and see where it doesn't. We'll find out that Stick's dictum, that when in doubt make the DMP play, doesn't always work, but it works a lot. That if you're not sure, making the DMP play is not a pretty, it's not a bad default, and that's why Stick practices playing DMP a lot, uh, because he knows when he plays other games, uh, if he knows what the right play is to win, just win the most games, that's often going to be the right play, even at other scores. Uh, where it's not DMP, where gamins matter, either way. Um, let me show you something. I've got 11 of these so far, and I'm going to keep adding to them over the years. I send my students, I go through one or two with my students in detail, going through mo only the hard or more complicated or difficult plays. And we also use uh, a lot, we use the dice distribution to see um, what are the toughest rolls to play. I want to find out how to play a 5, 1, 4, 1, 3, 1. These are the toughest roles. These are the roles that are bad for us. Those are usually the harder ones to play, and these usually are easier to play uh, the good ones. So that tells me which roles to really concentrate and ask about, too. But then when we're done, I send them all of these positions and ask them to work them on their self, uh, by themselves. And if they have, they're stumped by a play that they don't really understand the answer, 
that's going to be our next lesson to go through the ones that stump them. It's a great exercise. You don't need me to set up these positions and do this exercise. The next time you find yourself making an error, a big error in a checker play, where you really didn't understand the position, take that position and go through every single possible role and see how you play every role. That's how to find out why your first play was right or wrong and what and, and why it was wrong by understanding the entire position by going through every role and then change the position slightly like I did a minute ago and put this checker here and see if there's a concept. You'll start to develop thematic ideas and concepts and approaches and triggers in every one of these kinds of positions. And again, after you've mastered the first and second roles, if you can master the third, fourth, and fifth roles, you've got a huge leg on everybody else because those are the plays and situations that come up the most. Nothing is more common than this position, and that's why you should know this position very well. And the next most common thing is positions like this, the second role. And that's why you need to know those role. And the next most common positions are things like this, the third role positions. And then what I just showed you was a fourth or fifth role position. Those are very common too. So if you can develop expertise in those early games, of course you also to be a great backgammon player. You need to know how to play the bear off in the end games and everything else too. But this is the place to start. And the lessons you learn in the early game and middle game will help you tremendously later on. And if you're going to master the game one part at a time anyway, and that's the only way you can master this game, you're much better off starting at the beginning than starting at the end, because you're just going to win a lot more that way while you're learning the game. And by the way, you'll be done learning the game maybe in about 100 years, and hopefully you'll live that long and keep studying that long. That's my plan. And uh, I hope to be one of the greatest players in the world sometime within the next 100 years. If I keep going the way I'm going, I think I'll do it. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.